stream. We are dreamed into existence. What we do with that dream is up to us. This is Stream. I am Jessica Deruta, and I share with you my stream of consciousness. Please take what serves you and leave the rest. Let us begin. How we dream is as important as what we dream, for the what of the dream knows itself through the how. I want to feel both the beauty and the pain of the age we are living in. I want to survive my life without becoming numb. I want to speak and comprehend words of wounding without having these words become the landscape where I dwell. I want to possess a light touch that can elevate darkness to the realm of stars. Terry Tempest Williams, When Women Were Birds. Today is my offering to Moon Chiron. The moon and Chiron are tightly conjunct in the early degrees of Aries. Today is July 22nd, 2019, and this is Stream 12. Today, I want to be vulnerable. I fear what I have to say will hurt those who hear. I'm afraid you won't like the way my voice touches your ears. No, wait, I don't trust you will understand. Do I think I am better than you? Do I think that because I am afraid? Afraid you won't love my truth, the truth that pierces through. Can I pierce you? Don't be like me, my mother would say. You don't want to be like me. Terry Tempest Williams is a creative nonfiction writer, and I'm reading her book, When Women Were Birds. The book is about voice and the relationship to mother. And as we know, we develop our voice, our mother tongue, from the breast of our mother. Now, some say that we developed language from eating psilocybin mushrooms, another form of mother consciousness. However, the physicality of speaking is believed to have come from the infant at the mother's breast, the sucking on the nipple and the meeting of the mouth with the breast, that threshold, that space of contact there, the baby makes noise blah, 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 while it's touching the breast. And at first we don't need language verbal language, because the idea is, is we're given everything we need at first. Milk from the mother's breast, warmth, cuddling, love, safety, protection. These things are taken care of us, for us. Our physical needs are taken care of. At least that's the idea, right? That's the intent and that's how we've survived by and large, as a species, is from that care and that love of the attachment between the newborn infant and the mother. Now, as the baby grows and the needs start to become more complex as we form greater autonomy, meaning that as we grow and we gain a greater sense of self, our needs become a little bit more complexified. And so the development of language begins. Blah, 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 mama, mama, papa, papa, I'm hungry. When we start to need to eat food that isn't just milk, 
but more complex foods, solid foods. We develop language to ask for what we want. I want a peach. I want cereal. I want a hug. I'm cold. I'm lonely. Now, children don't always necessarily say it in such direct manners, although some do, or some aspects of, I want a peach, I'm hungry, I'm cold. So language develops out of the natural individuation process between the infant and the mother. <clears throat> but at the core of that is the primary attachment. So first comes the primary attachment, and then the baby develops, and there comes language out of that primary attachment from the complexification of the needs that derive out of our growing self-possession that we continue throughout our entire lives as we know thyself, as we discover thyself. It moves from physical needs, food, warmth, comfort, to emotional needs, <laughs> food, warmth, comfort, <laughs> to psychological needs, food, warmth, comfort. And so our analogies and our metaphors for psycho psychology and spirituality often derive out of physicality, out of our baseline needs of food, warmth, comfort. We need those things metaphorically and symbolically on every level of existence when we're in this human body. So moon Chiron, the moon being our attachment, our needs, our relationship with our mothers, our relationship with our children, our relationship with our family. It is the family. And even though there is the moon in that personal dimension of our needs, our body, our feelings, it really is the other people in our life that begins with the other members of our family. So whatever aspects your moon in your birth chart tells us a lot about your family culture. It tells us about the imprinting that happened when you were conceived and in the womb and when you came out. The imprinting that happened psychosomatically in the emotional body from the relationship that you had with your family. But the thing about a family is, is that you're born into it, meaning that the structure of the family, the rules, the norms, the customs, the spoken and unspoken ways of relating and being, belief systems, religious practices, socioeconomic status. These are already established. Generation after generation after generation in your ancestral lineage is an inheritance, an inheritance that we each inherit, that we're each born into, and that's the moon. And that's the level of vulnerability that the moon has in it, in our charts, because a lot of it isn't a conscious choice that comes from the egoic will. The egoic will has more to do with the sun, the solar logos, the individual principle that is born out of the moon, that is born out of the family, that is born out of one's early childhood experiences as we individuate and step into our autonomy and our self-possession, we're stepping more into the sun. However, that is always embedded and grown out of the moon. The moon comprised of many individuals, your mother and your father, your siblings, your cousins, your aunts, your uncles, close family friends, primary caretakers, your nanny, your teachers. The moon is all the other people in our lives comprised of many different suns. 
And that's vulnerable because we inherit that. And we inherit that before we have language. And so there's an imprinting. And that's a good word for the moon. It's an imprinting. Now, part of what we inherit in our lineage, going generations back, are the gifts and the challenges of our ancestors. We are here because of the survival of every single one of our ancestors. A long line of people in an ecosystem of a long line of plants and animals, rocks and minerals, the earth and the sky, the planets who hold space for us, and so much more from the unseen world. But from the seen world, the waters, the earth, the air, the spirit. And this ecosystem and our ancestors come together symbiotically and create culture from the spirit of the land of your people. And language comes with culture and culture comes with language. And just as that's happening for the people that we come from in our ancestry, that happens within our now modern day nuclear families, whether that was just you and your mom or just you, your mom and dad, or you and your mom and dad and siblings, whether that was two people or five people or 10 people or 20 people, Each family has a culture with spoken and unspoken beliefs and rules. And the wisdom of our ancestors, the things that they often painstakingly learned through trial and error, through survival, through life and death, we carry cellularly, genetically in our DNA, in our bodies. The memory of our ancestors are carried in our bodies. And along with that wisdom, we know inherently is also trauma, right? So often our wisdom, embodied knowledge coming through learning, often comes from pain and suffering. And pain and suffering often can have a traumatic component to it. Our wounds. The things that we've suffered through, the things that our ancestors have had to suffer through. And this is Chiron, the archetype of the wounded healer, the gifts and the challenges, the healing and the wounds that we inherit from our ancestors, the transpersonal immortal wound, our Achilles heel, the place where the light gets in. And so Moon Chiron is the ancestral karmic wounds and wisdom and ability to heal that we carry in our familial emotional body. Again, on a cellular preverbal level. It's in our bones. It's in our muscle memory. It's in the neuron pathways of our brain and the way our brains are wired in the limbic system 
in the nervous system. If you look at the anatomy of the body and you see all those muscles and joints and tendons and you see all the veins and the nerves that connect them, that is where the physical memories of our ancestors are carried, including the ancestors of our past selves, our past lives. And so the body is an amazing, precious resource because in a way it is the physical representation of the Akashic field, all the memories that have ever happened to you and to you in this physical life of this particular incarnation, but of all your incarnations. The body and the brain are wired to mimic the mind field that we are in and surrounds us. Energetically, vibrationally. Some say we do not have love in our heart, but we are inside of love. That mind is not inside of us, but that we are inside of mind. The physical body is the physical representation of the mind or the love that we are inside of. So Terry Tempest Williams, who is a brilliant writer, had a speech impediment when she was a little girl. And in fourth grade, she was pulled aside and asked to stay in from recess. She was told by this special teacher that she had a lisp. Now, she didn't know she had a lisp until she was told she had a lisp as is often the case with our wounds. We don't know that it's something that makes us different until somebody points it out to us. That usually happens pretty early on. Now she was made fun of by her friends. Sometimes she'd laugh with them, sometimes she wouldn't. But there wasn't the direct confrontation with the lisp until this special teacher said, your regular teacher tells me you have a lisp. So we're going to stay inside three times a week and work on it together. And so the weekly lessons began. And Terry was guided to learn how to not swallow her tongue or to press it up against her tooth in a way that made Sally sound like Thally. And the teacher, a very gifted, special Chiron teacher, said, it's the relationship to the wound that decides whether or not it's poison or medicine. You move your tongue a little to the left and we practice again and again as that tongue is a muscle for muscle memory, we can turn your th into S's and you will no longer be afraid to read in front of the class. Now, the teacher didn't verbatim say all those things. I wasn't there. But for the sake of the story of Moon Chiron, this is what the teacher essentially said. And so the teacher used poetry to practice speaking. And what Terry learned was that in order to speak, she had to learn to listen. She had to learn to listen to the rhythm and the melody of words and how they wanted to be spoken. And so listening comes before speaking. It is a requirement 
to speak. And so Terry learned to listen. And through poetry, she fell in love with words. And what was her wound? A source of great embarrassment ended up becoming her gift and her offering creatively to the world through her writing, through her books, through her speaking, which to this day she is still terrified to do in front of groups of people. And there comes the fear. And she says she gets up, she acknowledges it, she steps around it, and she speaks from that place that comes truth. The quivering heart where all beautiful and brave things are spoken from. And so that is Chiron. That is the journey of Chiron. And every single one of us has that journey that we go on. And we can often see the wounds of Chiron in our early childhood experiences. That place where things come in and go out with much more ease. Where we are permeable and open. Before life has presented enough things to us that maybe makes us more blocked or defended or shut down in ways we may have closed our hearts or our minds as we humans do when we encounter pain and loss in our lives, even if it's just for a time or forever. Forever, as in not forever, ever, but forever in this life. And so I share this story of Terry to illustrate and illuminate from the inside out the moon Chiron energy. Now, I said I wanted to be vulnerable today, and so I'd like to share a little bit of my moon Chiron. I always find that it's easiest to speak from my own personal experiences, and yet I also find it the hardest thing to do. The easiest for me, the hardest for others, because naturally implicated in my story are other people, many of whom are still alive, some of whom listen to this podcast. And so I walk a thin line wanting desperately to be authentic and real and yet mindful and conscientious of the others, of the many others in my story. If it were just me and just the sun were existing, I could tell you all night and day. (laughs) But because there is the moon, the many others that make up my relationships, Sometimes it's trickier to do. My father and his wife and three children, my brother, two brothers and sister, half sister and half brothers, came to visit recently, just last week. As many of you are aware, we had two significant eclipses this month of July, 2019. July 2nd, we had a solar eclipse and July 16th, we had a lunar eclipse and overlapping with that, Mercury has been retrograde and still is. So the timing of it was a bit of a surprise. It wasn't clear when they were going to come. And so they, they happened to arrive in this eclipse portal in Cancer Capricorn, which has a lot to do with that access between family, belonging and connection, Cancer, and work, Capricorn. 
And as eclipses do, they have a tendency to bring up ancient history, the past, in order to be unveiled, revealed, and faced, I believe, in a way to metabolize, to process what has always been there, but maybe hasn't been seen yet, or has been forgotten, or has just been buried just because that's what happens through time and relationships. So I've seen my father six times in the last 10 years. Um, Many of you are going to be familiar with that story. If you've read my master's thesis or you've just heard me speak in other forums, but Part of my Chiron wound, with my Chiron there in Gemini on the IC, opposite Saturn, square Jupiter, opposite Saturn, Uranus, square Jupiter, on my angles. There's a early childhood wounding around voice, Gemini, and it's connected with ancestry the IC, and it's connected with Father, Saturn, and it's connected with the personal Father, but also the archetypal Father, and the parts of Saturn that can relate to separation, abandonment, negation, judgment, criticism, and authority, self-possession. And my parents divorced when I was four. My mom would say five. I'll say four. (laughs) And I then saw my dad once a year for about 10 days or so every summer. Go to visit him, take an airplane, start flying by myself when I was five. And then I did that through high school. And then he moved away. Uh, He got remarried and had three kids and they moved back to the Middle East, and then they came back again five years ago. So there were some gaps in our relationship. But part of the script that I inherited uh, from that loss and that trauma is that... that I did not belong, that I did not have inherent worth and value. Because if I did, then I wouldn't have been left. And in there was also a taking of responsibility to a pretty extreme degree that is not appropriate or healthy for a child to do, but is a natural response to that wound. I took responsibility for everything that happened to me in the sense that I always made it about me, personalized it as a child does, right? A child. It's safer for them to make themselves bad instead of the parent out of a survival need. So I made myself bad and made myself wrong and therefore made myself responsible for any pain or hurt or loss that I would go through. And I would personalize it in the sense that the other person was doing it because there was something wrong with me. I'd made a mistake. I had failed. I didn't do something right. And because I was an only child and a Capricorn, I grew up very quickly. I was often described as a young child as being an old soul or a wise soul. Now, whether or not that's true, 
My personality and my character showed that in part out of survival. And now this is where things start to get interesting with the chironic wound. I don't believe it's possible in human form or the point of the story to separate out our wounds from our needs, from our essence. Who I am is Jessica. In part comes from the essence of my soul. Living through the archetypal dynamics of my birth chart, which are a reflective co-arising of my karma, personal and collective, individual and familial, and the reflective co-arising of my biography, which includes my wounds. Just as Terry Tempest Williams could not separate out who she is as a creative nonfiction writer from her lisp as a child, I cannot separate out who I am as a lover, who I am as a friend, who I am as a therapist, a philosopher, an astrologer, from the fact that I was not raised by my father. Now, I understand the urge to go back to the time of the golden age of nostalgia before a wound ever happened. And what I want to say to that is although that is a very valid and necessary feeling, I believe, in the human experience, it in part is where a sense of hope and safety comes from. That place does not exist in this realm. Now, maybe it exists in another realm, in the life between lives, in our non-physical form. However, if we are in part our memories and we have incarnated countless times with countless experiences of great beauty and joy and profound pain and suffering, then our soul is an amalgamation of lifetimes of wounds. And that is where our wisdom and our creativity and our love comes from. So to bring this into human form, what does it look like, right? That's always the question here. What's that look like? Moon Chiron, what does that look like? Well, part of what it looks like is us honoring our needs, that aspect of the moon of needs. Now, many of us feel unconsciously and subconsciously that our needs are weaknesses, that they make us unenlightened and unevolved. And I believe part of that 
comes from the sheer vulnerability of being in our needs. And I'm, I'm going to give you an example here. But I think another part of it is the entrenched thought forms that collectively saturate the human psyche right now in patriarchy. That there has been a colonialization of our needs and our emotional body and our inner child out of a culture based around power, domination, and control. The things that present themselves as conflict points in relationship are power, control, dependency, and vulnerability. When I do couples work, these are the four areas that we tend to focus on as areas of conflict. Yet it's those same four areas that drive our erotic sexual needs. Power, control, dependency, and vulnerability. And I sit with people all day long and it always comes down to having needs and dependency and the profound shame around that. Because oftentimes those needs and that dependency comes out of our trauma. The places that we've been deeply wounded and hurt, often very early in life, in our relationships, because that's usually where and how we get the most hurt is with other people. Whether that was your parents or your siblings or some caretaker, those are where our wounds happen are in relationship. That's why shame is a social wound. It's where there's a disconnect that happens in relationship. And so how do we repair our shame? It's often in, by, and through relationship, the very source of where that pain came from, which is why it feels so counterintuitive and oftentimes like life or death. And so we have a lot of deeply held beliefs that what it means to be enlightened is to not have any needs. What it means to be enlightened shows that you no longer have pain. Now you might say, no, 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 come on, we don't believe that. But I think if you really sit with it and you really challenge your beliefs about what does it mean to be mature, what does it mean to be evolved, what does it mean to be enlightened, whatever terminology you use there, What I've seen again and again is it means to not depend on other people and to not have needs. And I think a lot of new age spirituality and new age psychology and new age understanding on relationships carries this deeply held, I believe, toxic belief at the core of it. And in part, I mean, who can blame us? when the image of God is so often a male God who's separate and apart and doesn't have any needs, right? Omnipotent, omniscient, right? If God is all-knowing and all-powerful, then God can't have any needs. And if God is a man, a white man or whatever, you're not in relationship except with subjects that are below and subservient, that image of God sets up a submissive, subverted, and I believe a degraded relationship, not just between God and human, but then between human and human. Because if in part the human is made in the image of God or the goddess, then our worldview or our cosmological beliefs would then naturally follow that what it means to be godlike is to be independent, separate, individual without any needs or dependency. And so the reformation of our God is required in order to reform how we show up in relationship. 
And this is in part what helps when we start to refer to as goddess or in her, she pronouns, is at least it brings it back into the female feminine form, which we know is one that can carry gestation. And we know that that's where children come out of. And that primary relationship of attachment allows us to bring in the human form of attachment, which is the derivative of all of our needs and emotional life and our language. Our language comes out of our needs. We, we have language because we need. And we need because, in a sense, we are individuals and we are separate. And the way that we connect back, which religion means to bind back, the way we connect back is through our language and through communicating. And all the ways that we communicate and express ourselves. Language is a pathway for connection, whether that's verbal language, body language, touch. So, we have to begin to look at the ways that our uh, idea of what it means to be in love and in relationship and what it means to heal has been colonized or colonialized by the patriarchy, which is based upon separatism, competition, which often looks like a situation where there's not enough room for two people to both have their needs. It's either or. And there's so much shame and repression around what the needs are that there's often not even discussion around it because that would be too weak or too vulnerable, too pathetic. So let me give you an example here. Because I live with anxiety, and there's many reasons for that, <laughs> um, because of that early abandonment and because my mother was a single mother working, you know, having her life. I had separation anxiety as a child. It was extremely difficult for me uh, whenever my mother would leave, whether that was when I was at daycare or even if my grandmother was watching me and it would get worse at nighttime. So during the day, it would be okay if the sun was out and there are other children around and I was playing, I was occupied. It would still be very painful, but I, I, I managed, you know, I'm, I'm, I have, I've always had a lot of friends. I'm very social. So, you know, I had that, but underneath of that was a lot of anxiety and a lot of pain, but then nighttime would come. And as soon as it would get dark, I would get very anxious and I would stand at the window for an hour or two before my mother was supposed to come home. And I would look out the window waiting for her. And I wouldn't be able to do anything else. Maybe for a moment I could get pulled away, have a snack, something. But then I'd go right back out to staring out the window. And every car that would turn the corner, I'd go, oh, is that my mother? And if she was five minutes late, the panic would strike me and take me over. And it would get worse and worse and worse for every minute that went by. And when my grandmother was watching me, she practiced different techniques with me like breathing. And we'd count backwards from 10. We'd take deep breaths. She'd play piano for me. She'd hold me. Maybe we'd play a game of cards, you know, to do all these things to try to regulate my nervous system. And it would work here and there, but deep in me, in my body, the physicality of the anxiety and the separation was unbearable. So that is a wound, a moon Chiron wound that I carry from my early childhood experience. Now, as an adult, I would like to say to you, well, you know, I've, I've grown and I have a lot of tools and awareness and I'm a therapist and I'm highly educated, yada, yada. And so I'd like to be able to report to you that that's no longer an issue for me because I've done medicine ceremonies and I've been in therapy and I've gone through lots of trainings. 
No. No, that's not true. Now, what is true is all those things have happened. And I do have greater awareness. And I do have tools to help me. But I'll tell you what helps me the most. Is instead of white knuckling it through an evening. When my husband is out. Let's say Travis has a gig. He's playing music and I'm not going to it. Or let's say he's out with friends. In order for me to not white knuckle through the night and be filled with anxiety to the point where I can't focus on anything and I can't have an enjoyable evening to myself, I need to know what time he's coming home. And if he is going to be later than 10 o'clock, I want a text message to say, hey, honey, I'm out with friends. We're having a great time. I'm going to stay out until midnight, and I'll see you then. I love you. That text message allows me to feel securely attached again. And when we feel securely attached, we feel safe. And when we feel safe, we can relax. And when we can relax, we can do just about anything. And then my night becomes my night. And I can do whatever I want with the rest of that time. I can read, I can write, I can watch Netflix. I can do whatever I want. Because the person that I'm attached to in my primary relationship, which is my husband, knows that I have a wound, an anxiety that happens at nighttime when my partner is away and that I do much better, much, much better with that simple text message. Now, it took us some time when we were dating to figure that out. It took times and evenings of me being filled with terror and anxiety and white knuckling it and not wanting to look needy and dependent and like a fool excuse me can you please tell me what time you're coming home because i feel so anxious but i'm just coming home in a couple hours what does it matter i know right i don't want to be seen as a pathetic little needy girl but guess what there's still a part of me who is a needy little girl and can sometimes feel pathetic that at the age of 32, I don't know how to self-soothe and get through it all by myself without needing the other person. However, the source of the anxiety is around my attachment with the other person. And so out of love, out of safety, Out of care and respect, Travis lets me know. Because that contact makes or breaks my night. And that contact shows me that he loves and cares about me. Not some idea or ideal version of me, but me, Jessica, who carries a wound around abandonment and separation anxiety. We all have needs and we all have needs that come out of our wounds. And so I do not believe that an evolved, healed, enlightened person is one who somehow doesn't need other people anymore or doesn't need to express what they need in order to be okay. I don't actually believe that that exists. And after over a decade of sitting with people from all walks of life, of all ages, of all sexual orientations, committed and not committed relationships, I have yet to meet a single person where that is true. And I hear it all day long. But I don't want my needs to come out of my wounds. I want to heal my wounds so I don't have those needs. And what I want to say is, what heals those wounds? 
is having those needs and speaking those needs and working on that with a safe, kind, loving person who has compassion and understanding around that. Because you know what happens now more than ever for me? I live with less anxiety than I ever have. I still live with it. But I am the most productive, the most creative, and the most loving I've ever been in my 32 years. And that is because Travis and I have made agreements around how to show up in our relationship with one another, around each other's needs. Some, if not most of which, come out of our wounds. And so this is my offering to all of you and to Moon Chiron. Our gifts, our wisdom, our creativity and our love come often out of our pain and our suffering, our trauma. And if we keep having the goal being to erase that, we erase ourselves, the most precious thing about being human. Our beautiful and unique stories of who we are and how we've come to be. We erase our hearts and our love by trying to erase our wounds and our needs that come from those wounds. So I send loving kindness to all of you in those most vulnerable and tender places that all of us get scared around, that I get scared around, and where we have shame and humiliation. And I love you in those places as I continue to practice and learn to love myself in my own places. And this is my offering to you, to humanity, and to Moon Chiron. This is Stream, and I'm Jessica Derutza. <laughs>